I guess we should probably go ahead and get started so we can stay on, on somewhat on time. And uh, the, the second presentation that I want to give you guys today is, is on soul fertility. And uh, in this quote and concept, there's actually a section on, on uh, fertilization and uh, soils in there. And, and there's some good quotes in there. And I thought about using one of those, and then, and then I thought, you know, Gary forgot a quote in here. And, and so I made up my own quote. And, that, and my own quote is, profitable livestock production starts with the soil. And, and we don't think enough about that, but the soil plays such a critical role in the production of grass, and the production of grass plays a critical role in feeding livestock. And, and it, really, it, it really all starts with the soil and soil fertility. And that's what we want to talk about today is, is basic soil fertility and grazing systems. I don't prescribe to the notion that we can make something out of nothing. If you read some popular press articles on mob grazing and, and uh, uh, methods, they, they make like all of a sudden that you mob graze once and you've got all this soil fertility built up in the soil. And I've never prescribed to that. I, we don't really make something out of nothing. We've got to have a base level of soil fertility there to really establish a profitable grazing system. And, and that's kind of what I want to talk about is some basic concept with soil fertility, a little bit about soil testing and, and then looking at soil test results. And, and keep in mind, soil testing and soil test results are going to vary from state to state and lab to lab. So I'll show you an example from Virginia and talk a little bit about that. But, but the concepts are the same, is that uh, they provide you with a guideline to design a nutritional program for your pastures. We, we often think as, as livestock people about designing a nutritional program for livestock, and it's very similar for pastures. We're trying to see what's deficient in their, their nutritional program and then, and then meet that deficiency. Whenever I talk about soils and soil fertility, I like to start out with a general definition of what soil is. And this comes from a classical soils test text. This was a soils text that we used when I was a graduate student at, at Ohio State University in the early 1990s, and um, Brady and Wheel. And, and um, a soil is a dynamic natural body composed of, of mineral, inorganic solids, gases, and liquids. A lot of times when we think about soils, we think about sand, silt, and clay. Everybody probably remembers that classical triangle in, in the proportion of sand, silt, and clay is how we just determine the texture of a soil. And that's important, but, but what's more important is what comes next in living organisms. So, so we've got the physical part of the soil and then we've got the living part of the soil. And we don't talk enough about that, that living part of the soil. We've got a whole presentation on that and, and Mary's been working with that too from the sounds of her presentation. Um, but, but today we're gonna focus primarily on soil fertility and the concepts associated with soil fertility. And all those things together makes a medium for plant growth. This is a, um, a slide that was put together by Ed Rayburn at West Virginia uh, University. And, and it's nice, it, it takes um, data from several sources and kind of puts it together in a, into a, a table format. And if we look at, at what's below, below ground, We've got pasture roots at about 2,500 pounds per acre. We've got soil bacteria at 2,000 pounds per acre. Think about that just for one minute, how big of a soil bacteria is and how many would have to be present in the soil to make up 2,000 pounds of soil bacteria per acre. Atenomycetes, which are similar to bacteria, we've got fungi, algae, protozoa, nematodes, mites, other insects, earthworms, all are present in the soil, dung beetles are all part of this, this, this uh, ecosystem underneath the soil. And, and they all play an important part in, in soil and nutrient cycling within the, in the system. And, uh, and sometimes we forget to talk about that. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on this today. This is about the only slide you're gonna see on that. But it's important to remember that the soil has a living component to it. A healthy soil does. Now, when we get into a row crop situation and we've had continuous tillage for years and years, we tend to decrease the, the living part of that soil somewhat. 
Whenever we talk about soil fertility, I'd like to start out and just introduce the concept of von Liebig's law of the minimum. And essentially what it says is that whatever is the most limiting essential plant growth factor is going to limit overall production. And there's lots of different plant growth factors. There's things like uh, fertilizer, like potassium, or nitrogen, or phosphorus, or soil acidity, moisture in the soil temperature. All those can limit plant growth. Whatever's the most limiting is going to hold back overall plant growth. So when we design a fertility system for pastures, we want to have a balanced approach to that. So we can't just put nitrogen on our pasture and we can't just put phosphorus on our pasture. We've got to meet all those nutrient needs in kind of a balanced program. And we can think of that kind of in, in animal growth too. So when we design a ration for, say, a, a growing animal, we don't just give them crude protein, right? We balance that ration with energy in minerals and vitamins so that we'll get optimal animal production. It's the same way for a pasture. We've got to have a balanced fertility program. We can't just pick and choose one nutrient to supply um, in our fertility program. We've got to have a balanced approach to that fertility program. So what, what makes a good soil for a pasture? And I'll just tell you right now, not all soils are created equal. Um, Generally speaking, we want a deep, well-drained, fertile soil. And uh, we want it to have the ability to hold a lot of nutrients and a lot of water. And generally speaking, a medium textured soil is going to be the best at holding water. That's not a clay type soil and not a sandy type soil, but a loamy type soil, which has approximately equal proportion of sand, silt, and clay in it, is going to have the most plant available water. A clay soil will actually hold more water but it holds it so, so tightly that the plants can't get the water off that, off that clay. So it has actually less plant available water. Um, high organic matter, we want it to be loose and porous. We want it to have good structure. So when, when we break it up, instead of being all small pieces, it actually comes out kind of in um, aggregates or, or clumps. And we want to have high biological soil activity. So, so all those things that we talked about on one of the first slides we looked at. So how, how do we assess a soil? NRCS, a long time ago, came up with a, a land capability grouping. They group soils from one to eight. Generally speaking, soils that are one to five are, are uh, suitable for agriculture use. When you get past five, it's not really suitable even for pasture use. So we group those with one being the most productive soils and, and five being the least productive soils in the agricultural setting. And I'll show you some, some data on that in, in a minute. But that gives us an idea of the potential productivity of that soil. And then we um, assess the chemical constituents of the soil, like pH and uh, nutrient concentrations through soil testing. And using soil testing is kind of like sending a sample into a lab of, of feed for analysis. It gives us an idea of what's there in the soil and what we're going to have to supplement um, in that soil. So this is productivity grouping. And I'll just use alfalfa in, in grass mixture here. If we look at a productivity group one soil, that's going to be our most productive soil. And we're going to have the potential to yield, if it's managed well, greater than six tons per acre with alfalfa. If we go down to a group four soil or a group three soil, we have the potential to yield you know, less than four tons per acre. So there's in different inherent, in, inherent characteristics in different soils that limit overall productivity. Why am I telling you this? Because when we design fertility programs, we have to realize that, that soils that are more productive will respond to more fertility within that system. Soils that are less productive will tend not to respond to increased levels of soil fertility because there's inherent characteristics of that soil that are limiting production, whether it's high rock fragments or whether it's a shallow top soil or whether it's highly eroded soil. Something inherently different about that soil is limiting overall productivity. So how do you tell what kind of soil you have? And there's a great tool called the Web Soil Survey. And um, that can be accessed on the, uh, the internet. It's pretty easy to use. Most, most of you, if you use a computer, can go in there and take a look at the type of soil that you have. You go to the Web Soil Survey page, you put in your address or your county, and it kind of takes you to that address. And then you can actually 
look at an aerial map of your farm and draw a polygon on it and it'll tell you the kind of soils that you have on your farm. And it'll tell you all kinds of different information about those soils. Anything from, from uh, the ability to build a house there to how, produ how productive other crops, crops will be on those types of soils. And then there's always the old school method. You go see your extension agent or you go to your soil and water conservation district and they can help get you a map of the soils on your, on your farm. Um, and you can learn a, a lot about the potential productivity of those soils on your farm. Now, just because you have productive soils doesn't mean that you're managing those soils to their maximum capability. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about is e even if you have a, a really good soil, if you have poor grazing management, you have poor fertility management uh, on those soils, then you're not getting maximum production. So all the pieces kind of have to come together for you to optimize production of any given soil. Um, this is a, a, a little schematic of nutrient removal in a cow-calf system. One of the most beautiful things about a grazing system versus a hay system or a silage system or a row crop system is that we're really removing small quantities of nutrients from that system. We've got inputs that come into our, our grazing system in the form of uh, fertilizer, manure, Legumes are bringing nitrogen into our system. Um, feed, anything that we feed, whether it's a concentrate feed or whether it's a hay, is bringing nutrients into that grazing system. And then they get cycled through that system. And, and the cycle starts with the grazing animal. So as they consume the forage, they're extracting some nutrients from it. But, but the lion's share of those nutrients, 80 to 90% of those nutrients, go in one end of the animal and back out the other end of the animal, back onto the pastures. Now. As managers, we can impact how those nutrients are distributed on those pastures, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. And exports from this system are, are the animals that we're taking off of that system. So when we look at, at removal, this was done by John Lurie at the University of Missouri. It's in the Missouri Grazing Manual. A cow-calf pair will remove about 10 pounds of nitrogen, 7 pounds of P2O5 or phosphate, and a pound of... Um, potash per, per season. So just think about that. That's almost nothing. And then you divide that out for a stocking rate of two acres per cow-calf unit or three acres. We're removing very little nutrients from a grazing system. Now, we, remove, we do lose nutrients in other ways. We have leaching of nutrients through the soil. Um, sometimes some of the nutrients are fixed in the soil, depending on our pH. We'll look at that in a little bit. But but generally speaking, this is a very sustainable system if it's well managed. And we need to keep up with our, our nutrients and keep track of those and, and supply those as needed. But generally, we're pretty stable in terms of nutrient removal from a cow-calf system. One of the things that can happen when we, when we graze is that depending on how we manage our grazing, we can redistribute nutrients within that system. And, and that's important to realize. So if I have animals in this one big boundary, and they go out and they graze out here and they come back to lounge around shade and water source, which animals tend to hang out around, right? Um, they ruminate and they're feeling pretty good. They get up to go back out. What happens? Well, we, we deposit some nutrients, right? And over time, what happens is we can transfer nutrients from different places within a grazing system and concentrate them in, in shade and water sources primarily. How do we combat that in a grazing system? Well, we take those pastures and we kind of subdivide those pastures. And of course, an important part of subdivision and pastures and often limits rotational stocking is watering system. So we've got to have water sources out in these pastures. In this example, we're sharing a water source between four pastures. So when we, when we make those animals go into a smaller paddock and we make them graze in here and um, stay in here and don't let them lounge around the shade and water sources, um, we tend to get a better distribution of manure and we keep the nutrients from this area of the pasture in this area of the pasture. And so by managing grazing, we get all the benefits that, that Mary talked about and that I talked about in terms of plant growth and we also get a better nutrient distribution. If you've ever strip grazed tall fescue, the, the nutrient distribution or summer annuals is much better. You can look at the manure paths on, on that grazing strip that you were just on. 
So generally speaking, the smaller we make our paddocks, the more uniform the nutrient distribution is going to be. Not perfect, but more uniform. One, one of the concepts that I want to send you home with is that when we make hay off of pastures, we're removing nutrients and we're removing significant quantities of nutrients. And that's very important to manage because if we remove those nutrients, we've got to eventually put them back, right? It's kind of like a checking account. I can write a check and remove money from my account, but I can't keep writing checks if I don't deposit any more money in that account. Eventually, it's going to run out. And nutrients are like that in the soil. Um, so when we look at something like, uh, for example, um, orchard grass, and we remove 50 pounds of nitrogen per ton, we remove about 17 pounds of phosphate and 60 pounds of, um, of uh, potash per ton of hay that we make. So if we go in there and we make a hay cutting and we're removing two or three tons a year, say three tons, we're removing 180 pounds of potash from that per acre from that pasture a year, and we're removing about 50 pounds of um, phosphate those nutrients need to be replaced in that grazing system. You're not going to run out if you just do it for one year, but eventually what will happen is that, that the nutrients will get lower and lower and um, desirable species will tend to fade out and they'll be replaced with less desirable species like broom straw or other forage species that can um, persist under lower nutrient uh, concentrations. And a lot of times those species that replace the desirable forage species will be kind of a weedy species that's less productive and less palatable. So let's just look at a value of the nutrients in a ton of hay and we have to make some assumptions but these are the amount of nutrients we assumed. This is the cost of nutrients I called last week our local co-op and got some numbers from them. and. Um, so one ton of hay, we're going to remove about $35 worth of nutrients from that pasture. So that's in one ton of hay. Last week on Facebook, I saw somebody selling hay for $15 a bale. Okay, so just think about that for one, for one minute. For a 4 by 5 bale, say it takes three of those bales to make a ton of hay, right? So he's getting $45 for that hay. He just paid for fertilizer he's taken out of his pasture, $35. So he's making $10, right? No, no. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the, the hay market's tricky. A lot of times you can get, get hay for cheap, but you got to judge the quality of the hay that you're getting. Sometimes it's a little bit lower than you want, and you got to figure out what it's going to cost you to supplement that hay. It's, so it's not quite that easy. But the point is, is if, if you're working with smaller cow calf producers, I mean, a lot of times it doesn't make any sense for them to invest $150,000 in hay equipment when they can buy hay for $15 a, a bale. Eh, you might get some weeds in it, but, but you probably got some weeds already. Um, so it's just something to think about. The other thing in terms of hay is, is how we feed it. And, you know, I'm, I'm as guilty as everybody else. And it's cold and it's muddy in the wintertime and you're feeding hay. Where's the easiest place to put it? Right by the gate, right? So you just kind of throw it in there and go on. And, and uh that's not the best way to feed hay because you tend to get a nutrient concentration. If you've ever done grid soil sampling in a pasture, what you'll see is that where you feed hay at, there'll be this concentration of nutrients there. Ideally, it, if you can move those feeding points around your pasture or even unroll that hay, you're going to get a better distribution of those nutrients within the pasture. But you don't want to feed them all in one spot. It's ideal if you can move them around and, and feed your hay on your porous paddocks and you can even move nutrients um, within your farm and outside of your farm with hay. So say you have an old dairy farm. Where are the nutrients at on an old dairy farm? Close, close to the barn, right? Because that's, that's where you spread the manure. It was the easiest, right? So, so those fields close to the barn are going to have the highest nutrient concentrations. The fields far away are going to have lower nutrient concentrations. So if you make hay 
where there's high nutrient concentrations and feed it where there's low nutrient concentrations, not, not immediately, but over time you'll, you'll start to shift nutrient um, to those fields that are poorer on the farm. You know, probably our best management tool for soil fertility on programs is, is a soil test. And uh, they're, they're free in Virginia and free in Kentucky to, well, actually, they're $6 in Kentucky for producers, but it's still pretty, pretty inexpensive. And every state's going to be a little bit different on what they charge, and it's going to be a little bit more if you go to a commercial lab, most likely. But, but it really gives you an idea of what you have in that pasture. You can't really design a fertility program if you don't have some kind of base data to, to base that program upon. So it quantifies nutrients, phosphorus and potash primarily, not, not so much nitrogen, because nitrogen is kind of a transient nutrient within the system, so we, we have to either put nitrogen on, it's not going to stay in the soil. And it provides us a baseline, otherwise we're just kind of guessing at what to put out in that pasture. And, and a lot of people say when, you know, when fertilizer prices were so high, they say, oh, I'm not going to soil test, I can't even afford to put nutrients on. That's probably the most important time to soil test because you can really target your nutrient applications. You don't want to over apply nutrients and you don't want to under apply nutrients. And if you don't have a soil test, you, don't, you could be doing either one. So it's definitely worth the time because it's going to allow you to target those applications. And then you want to track them. You don't have to do soil tests every year, but every two or three years to kind of give you an idea of how the nutrients are, are uh, maintaining within your pastures is, is a good idea. I know you guys are not going to offer soil testing as part of your veterinary services, but maybe you could have encouraged people to soil test. And, and uh, you do have a soil probe with you? That's, that's pretty impressive, I've got to tell you. Um, the, the goal, like, like testing a feed, is to get a representative sample of that pasture. Generally, we want to test pastures that are 20 acres or less. Okay. Yep, so, so um, we want to sample pastures that are less than 20 acres. We want to get about 20 cores per pasture. As far as the sampling depth goes for pastures, we want to be in that, that three to four inch range is ideal for a, a pasture situation. A little bit different for row crops where we're disturbing the soil, a little deeper. Um, and, and then we want to take random samples. We want to uh, sample proper depth and avoid atypical areas, I said, and that's areas where we may have high nutrient concentrations. So we want to avoid areas around waters, we want to avoid areas where animals uh, lounge at for shade, um, or any other areas where we may have high nutrient concentrations. Um, so avoid like a hay ring, avoid your waterer, and, and then kind of randomly take samples by walking a zigzag pattern through that, through that field. We collect all those samples, put them in a bucket, we mix them up, and then we take a, a, a kind of a mixed sample for the analysis. Remember, we're trying to represent 2 million pounds of soil per acre, so it's really important we get a good uniform sample from that pasture. And then the last part is paperwork. Everybody hates paperwork, but, but it's really important for soil samples. And you got all the general information there. But, but probably the most important part is, is write, write down a sample ID that you can remember. Last thing you want to do is get a soil sample back and say, well, I can't quite remember where I got that soil sample from. Um, and then another, another important piece of information on the soil test form, and these will all vary from state to state, is the, the type of crop you're growing. They, they can't make a good recommendation unless you put that type of crop in. Is it a, a perennial pasture? Is it an annual pasture? Is it sorghum Sudan grass? Is it an alfalfa? They need to know that type of information um, to make a good recommendation. And we've got all the crops listed down here for the Virginia uh, soil sample form. One of the unique things that they do in Virginia that not many other states do is they make soil test recommendations based on your soil type. And so if you know your soil series, you can put it down here and they'll make a recommendation specifically for that soil series. Why is that good? It's good because of those land capability groupings. So 
they're not telling you to put the same thing on a, a, a really productive soil as they would tell you to put on a, a really poor soil. They'll tend to lower that fertilizer recommendation for a soil that has some inherent characteristics that's limiting overall productivity. And you'll get your sample back. And, and the first thing I always look at in the soil sample is my, my pH. And, and they give you two pHs here. They give you a, a buffered pH and a soil water pH. The buffered pH is used to make a lime recommendation in most states. Um, the soil pH, the water pH is the one that the, the actual soil is. So just to talk real quick about soil acidity and liming, and this will vary from area to area. Generally in the eastern United States, we have problems with low acidity in our soils. As we move west, we can have problems with alkaline or high pH in soils. This is a, soil pH is really a major factor limiting forage production in the southeastern United States. And, and uh, it tends to reduce nutrient availability in the soil, and it also reduces nitrogen fixation in the legumes. And we generally recommend liming based on a soil test, not just liming, but based on a soil test to neutralize soil acidity. It also supplies calcium and magnesium. And these are general guidelines for, for pastures. If we just have grass, we want to be about six. If we have a grass clover mix, we want to target six four. That'll tend to favor the clover and create an environment in which that clover can thrive. And if we're growing alfalfa or grass alfalfa mixture, we want to be pushing that pH up to seven to start with. Um, and, and then it'll kind of drift back down, and we want to definitely keep it above 6.5. Alfalfa is very sensitive to soil pH. So this is kind of what happens to nutrient availability in the soils. And so each one of these bands represents a different nutrient. The, the thicker the band is, the more plant available that nutrient is in the soil. And um, so, so for example, when we look here, on this, when we're between those desired pHs of six and seven, that's when most of our major nutrients are most available to the plant. So if you need lime in your pasture because you have a low pH, this is the most important thing that you can buy because it's making all the other nutrients within that soil more available to the plant. So you get your most bang for the buck when you invest it in lime, if you need lime on your pasture, and your soil test will tell you whether you need that lime or not. So again, this one recommends a ton and a half of agricultural lime here at the bottom. And then we've got lab results here, and, and they list the actual numbers, but, but they also list whether it's uh, considered low, very low, high, medium, and so on in, in the center there. And we can kind of think of these categories like this. If it's, if it's very low and low, then the nutrient's deficient in that field. And we would expect a yield response if we put that nutrient on that pasture. So ex low, very low, we expect a yield response. Um, so when we make a fertilizer recommendation, we put maintenance on. That's what, what you need to maintain where you're at. And then we also put a buildup on. Now, depending on the soil lab you go to, how they make that, that build-up recommendation will be different. Generally speaking, private labs tend to be more aggressive with the build-up. State universities tend to be a little more conservative with the build-up. Um, so that means they recommend a little bit less fertilizer overall. So it's going to take longer to build it up than a private lab recommendation. A medium, um, the nutrient's probably not deficient. It might be. And sometimes we'll get a yield response, but most of the time, not a real big yield response. Um, and we recommend maintenance and a little buildup fertilizer. When we get into this high soil test range, generally the nutrient is not deficient, and we get no yield response from additional fertilizer. So the only thing that we get is a maintenance application. So if you tell the soil testing lab, I'm making hay on this field, they're going to say, well, if you're making three tons of, of hay, you need to put on 150 pounds or 180 pounds of potash to replace what you've taken off of that field. So that's kind of just maintaining that field. And then very high, it's more than sufficient, no yield response, um, no fertilizer application is recommended. And if it gets too high, it, it may actually have negative environmental consequences. 
So if we're putting a lot of manure on our fields, we can tend to build up phosphorus in those soils, which can actually uh, cause environmental uh, degradation over time. So then somewhere on your soil test, you'll have a, a fertilizer recommendation. So they give you all this information, but it all boils down to this, this little block here. And it tells you how much nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and potassium you need to put on that field uh, to, to maintain it or to build it up. And this, again, is just a, a different graphical representation of, of the different soil test levels. So when we're down here in this very low and low range, we expect to get a yield response. This is yield response here um, to that fertilizer application. Less of a yield response, and then as you go into this high range and very high, we tend not to get a yield response. And, and this is ideal. If you can maintain that medium plus to, to high minus range, you're balancing right where you're not going to get a yield response, but you're not putting too much fertilizer on that pasture. In, in, in reality, if you can stay above medium, you know, medium, medium plus, you're, you're probably not tremendously limiting yield. Let's talk a little bit about legumes. We kind of talked about those earlier and um, in their importance in grazing systems. Those are actually nodules on that root. And um, those nodules are rhizobium, right in those nodules lives rhizobium bacteria. Let me see what I do with it. Oh, here's a nice, um, I brought a soybean plant. Soybean is a grain or a forage crop? But both, that's a good answer. Originally imported as a forage crop, not an, not an oil seed crop. And, uh, and, uh, but, but it's kind of evolved into that, but we can use it in, in summer annual mixtures or make, even make hay out of it. But what I want you to look at on here are the nodules on this root. These are actual nodules. Inside these nodules, um, rhizobium bacteria are in there fixing nitrogen for that plant. So legumes take nitrogen from the air, which is about 78% nitrogen, and fix it into a plant available form that the plant can use. And it increases yields. Um, having legumes mixed with grasses tends to increase forage quality um, and, and dry matter intake and, animal, and essentially animal performance. We can have improved summer growth from legumes like um, alfalfa because it has that deep tap root which can find water when other forage species can't find water. Cerecia lespedeza, is it a weed or a forage? You know, it's kind of on the borderline there. Um, some small room that guys like Cerecia, but it's not real palatable, you know, for the animal. So if you're managing cerecia in pastures, if it gets this tall, then you've probably let it go on a little too far. You know, it really needs to be down below your knees if you expect them to, to, to graze that cerecia. And, and there's some, I guess, some worming value in cerecia, the tannins in cerecia for small ruminants in some cases. And then probably for us, you know, in, in in the transition zone where tall fescue is our primary cool season grass, legumes are an important part of that system in terms of di diluting the amount of toxins in tall fescue and managing those toxins. It's not perfect, but it's better than grazing a straight tall fescue stand. And, and Ray will talk more about that later on. Um, this is the, uh, the amount of nitrogen fixed by different le legumes. Different legumes are, are more or less aggressive in nitrogen fixation. Alfalfa is by far our most aggressive nitrogen fixer, and um, annual espadiza is one of our least aggressive. And, and we can put a, a monetary cost on there depending upon the price of nitrogen. Currently, it's about 35 cents a pound. Um, and then we've got a, well, it's 70 cents a pound for a higher value when nitrogen prices may go up. Real quick, uh, nitrogen is shared indirectly, primarily between the legume and the grass plant. We always make like it's putting nitrogen fertilizer in the pasture. It's not quite like that. We've got to share it through grazing primarily. So the animal ingests that nitrogen. That nitrogen comes out in dung and urine. And then whenever we graze the plant, we get some root dye back and some nodule dye back, and that releases nitrogen into the system. But it doesn't happen overnight. It's going to take a, a little bit of time to build that nitrogen cycle up within the grazing system. And really, I, I say three years of good management before we really start to see all the benefits of grazing management within a grazing system. So 
don't get disheartened if you you try it one time and it doesn't happen that same season it's probably not going to make a big change that first season and then there there is some some direct transfer but it's pretty pretty limited and there's some leakage of nitrogen from from legumes also in in, uh, that grass can kind of grab if you're growing it in association. Um, just a little bit about managing for legumes. When, when we think about incorporating legumes into pastures and they're an important part of grazing systems, we want to create an environment that's going to enhance their growth. So, so we wanted to make up, you know, 20 to 30 percent of the sward ideally. We want to lime and fertilize to encourage those legumes in there. So instead of keeping our pH at 5.8, we want it to be closer to 6.4 so that we'll encourage clover uh, in our pastures. And we want to have generally our improved legumes like red clover and ladino clover and alfalfa tend to like higher levels of soil fertility. So, so we want to think about building that soil fertility up to encourage their growth in that pasture. And then we can overseed legumes in late winter. We call it frost seeding in the transition zone. So we graze our pastures close. We broadcast the legumes on the freezing and the thawing and the soil incorporates those legumes into the soil. They germinate and come up in the spring. Works best with red and white clover, not so well with, um, with alfalfa. Alfalfa is not quite as shade tolerant as, as red and white clover. And generally in, in Kentucky, we recommend six to eight pounds of red clover broadcast in February with one to two pounds of a ladino or, or a large type white clover. And you can always throw a little bit of annual espadiza in there if you want a, a summer annual legume in that mixture. And then rotationally stock pastures. A lot of times just changing our grazing management tends to encourage legumes back to come back into pastures, you know, when we're we're grazing them a little bit tighter and we're opening that stand up and we let white clover come back into those pastures naturally. Legume seed can, can stay in the soil for decades and not germinate. So when we change management, a lot of times we'll get that seed to give it conditions where it can come up and be productive in that mixed stand again. So real quick, I'm finishing up soil tests and target nitrogen applications. You want to put um, your, your money where on soils that are very low and low in soil tests and also put more money on your most productive soils. That's where you're going to get the payback for that, that fertilizer. Always lime first if your soil test calls for it. If you have limited budget, you know, encourage people to put some lime on their pastures because it's making every other nutrient in that pasture uh, more available for plant growth. Always replace nutrients removed by hay. Um, you know, you can, you can remove hay and remove nutrients, you know, one or two times, but as you start to, to really take hay off and not put it back, and we commonly see this on, on absentee landowner ground, so where you don't have a, a lease on it, it's just kind of year to year, and they're letting you cut hay off of it, you don't have a lot of incentive to put fertility back in those pastures. And over time, it starts out pretty good, and then all of a sudden it gets a little bit of broom straw and a little bit more broom straw, and next thing you know, there's no orchard grass or fescue left. It's just broom straw because you've drawn the nutrient levels down in that, in that uh, hay field. Rotationally stocked pastures um, to, to maximize nutrient distribution and actively manage for legumes and grazing system improves forage quality, dry matter intake, and brings nitrogen into that grazing system. And then think about buying and feeding hay, especially for smaller operations. I mean, it just kind of makes sense if you can do that. And we didn't talk about it, but, but if you can get your hands on organic fertilizer sources, broiler litter, biosolids, depending on your feeling on biosolids, pelleted biosolids, uh, dairy effluent, whatever, you know, those are great nutrient sources as long as they're used responsibly. All right, and I'll just end with this parting thought. And in, in essentially, what it says is it takes three to five years to make really substantial changes in grazing systems through management. So don't get disheartened. Make your changes, stay the course, and, and you're going to reap the benefits in about three or four years. All right, is there any questions? Oh, I knew somebody was going to ask me that, and, and I don't have a good answer for that because I'm not from the western United States. Who, who's got a good high pH answer? 
Generally, in, in a horticultural situation, we'd apply elemental sulfur to bring the soil pH down, but well, whether that's a great solution in the Western United States, I just don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not. I'm I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to crap out on that one and tell you to talk to your local extension agent because he'll know for sure or your or your soil specialist for your state would know for sure how to manage that. Because my, my organic farms, when they quit spreading uh, potash to the natural soil, our soil pH is like prime in some cases. And you know, five to six years ago, all six years ago, that ingrowth, all kind of ingrowth, mutable alfalfa that was a thousand parts of the was just that. Growing down the soil down the I mean, I had a guy that put 150 pounds of elemental sulfur on. We, you know, we've, we, we haven't seen a lot of sulfur deficiencies in pastures in the Midwest yet, but, no, but, I don't have any to really, I have yet to see a one ton of soil test that was even in the medium. Yeah. We, we so we, we've really reduced sulfur emissions from power plants in the last 25 years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but that's something to watch for now in, in row crop situations in southeastern Virginia on lighter soils that are sandier, we, we commonly see sulfur deficiencies. But um, yeah. Is there any other questions? All right. Well, I guess we'll move on to our next speaker. What do we have next? Okay. Oh, did you um do you have your talk on here? Okay. Okay. <laughs> 